All right, welcome, welcome. I'm gonna spotlight all three of us for everybody to see at once. There we go. Awesome, thank you. Well, welcome, welcome everybody for joining us today uh, for our, uh, our Why Try webinar this week. We're super excited. Uh, we've got a great, a great panel of guests here. And I think this is gonna be a really important topic. I know this is a, a tough time of year sometimes to, to get people to show up for these. So thank you everybody that's here. And I hope that this will be information you'll be excited to, to take back. As usual, uh, we record these, we'll have them on our website. And so this will be material that you can review down the road as well. Um, and we're excited for you to be able to do that. My name is Jason Johnson. I represent the YTRI organization. We are the, um, the SEL organization that has been hosting these uh, for the last year plus. And as usual, we have come in with some incredible guests again today that I think have some very well organized and useful material that can, can help us all um, as we you know, finish up this year and charge over the recharge over the summer and then get ready to come back into next year. So uh, without further ado, let me first introduce the topic and then I'll introduce our, our panelists and then we'll get right into it. Um, we're gonna be talking about how we can use SEL to help um, help our schools thrive through reopening. And we've got some, a good combination today of kind of the, the game plan, the practical strategies, and then a practitioner that's actually put some of these into place that's gonna be able to combine her experience with the, the material being shared. So our panelists are as follows. Uh, first, we have Pat Connor. Pat is a senior policy and practice consultant for CASEL. Uh, that's the Collaborative for Academic, Social, and Emotional Learning. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about what that is, but as a consultant with CASEL, she provides technical assistance and support to states on SEL that are involved in the Collaborative States Initiative. She's been an educator for over 36 years, began her work in Sumner County Schools, Tennessee, as the director of Safe Schools, Healthy Students, before going to the Tennessee Department of Education as the executive director for the Office of Student Supports from which she retired in 2019. Pat believes that all students and adults thrive in a safe, just, and supportive school climate and that families, caregivers, and communities are critical partners in building equitable systems that support student success. Amen. Um, welcome, Pat. Thrilled to have okay. you. Thank you. Glad to be here. Uh, next, we have Kathleen Cronister. Kathleen is the Social Emotional Learning Director for Davis School District in Utah. Previously was the Alternative Education Principal in Davis School District, where she had responsibility to lead and supervise nine campus locations with a variety of programs for at-risk students, including Mountain High School, Renaissance Academy, and Davis Adult Learning. Um, am I pronouncing your last name correct? I never verified you did oh, really good. well, Jason. <laughs> Ms. Cronister has served on numerous district and state committees. She is the current president of the National Alternative Education Association. She's the past president of the Utah chapter of ASCD and has served as the special purpose school representative for the Utah Association of Secondary School Principals. She's been active in advocacy in the state of Utah and was instrumental in guiding policymakers to better understand the mission of alternative schools, which resulted in an appropriate accountability system for alternative high schools in Utah. Um, married with three children, five grandchildren, active in the community and projects focused on serving needs of refugees, women and children. Um, Welcome, welcome. Personal, let, I want to make sure I get this. Philosophy on personal happiness is to spend two minutes each day sending a positive email, text, or personal note of gratitude to at least one person. Thank you so, so much. Thank you, Jason. Nice to be here. And then I am Jason Johnson. I am the, uh, the representative of the Y-Tri organization here. My background is I'm a school psychologist. 
uh, came from public ed, came over about six years ago. Um, I had been working in the Alpine School District in, uh, in the state of Utah and have been with uh, YHRI since. I oversee research and development and uh, oversee the training for the, the organization here. And it's been my great pleasure to be able to be the uh, kind of the moderator and facilitator on the, the majority of these um, webinars for the past year plus. So um, today is no exception. I'm really excited to see where the discussion goes today. Uh, sometimes we do these in kind of like a, a discussion type format, but today the information we have, I think is coming in in a way that really does need to be organized a little bit more directly um, than, than what a just a conversation facilitates. So in this one, I'm going to turn the time over to our panelists uh, because they have uh, they have their material organized, I think, in a way that will speak the best for itself. So I'm just going to throw it over. I think we're going to start with Pat, and uh, then I'm going to let you two go back and forth. I'm going to be here in the background um, providing links in the, uh, in the chat tool as, uh, as necessary. And with that, go ahead and take it away, Pat. Okay, let me get myself set up here. Well, thank you so much, uh, Jason, for the, the warm welcome and the introduction. And I love your music. Uh, that really uh, set the tone for what I hope is a productive and informative time together. And I've known Kathleen, uh, she and I are, are involved, or I'm not involved anymore. I rolled off the board of the National Alternative Educators Association and um, just a, a strong group of caring um, adults who really care about outcomes for our most at promise students. So, well, put on your seat belts because we're going to take off and present a lot of information in a short amount of time. But I do wanna let you know that you will receive, this is recorded, but uh, also if I'm not mistaken, Jason, will they receive the uh, PowerPoint? We can make it available if, if you okay. would like to. If you, if you authorize that, um, we can make that available. Okay, absolutely. Um, what we have to share, we'd like to share and share, have others share with others. So, uh, so today, Kathleen and I are coming to you uh, about reopening schools. Uh, I know that many of us have been in school uh, throughout the COVID, some of us through hybrid, just different modes. Uh, of ways we've been back to school and serving children. But it's, as you know, it's been a difficult year. I know I'm preaching to the choir. You understand the many challenges uh, that are associated or were associated with the last year and looking forward to reopening school on a different, more positive note this fall. And with that in mind, Castle, the group that I belong with. And I hope if you don't know about Castle, that you will visit our website, which is castle.org. Um, and it's got a ton of resources to help you as you plan for this year. And we're going to share some of those with you today. But our um, presentation today is going to be about reopening school with SEL at the center and uppermost, because what we know now, it's more important than ever because we have students, we have educators, we have families that are really struggling with uh, heightened anxiety and trauma. And there is a way forward and it's through social emotional learning because those are the skills, not just students and children, but adults need to navigate these waters uh, for success. So we're happy to share our roadmap as we call it in Castle for reopening school. And what I love about our presentation today with Kathleen is her district took this uh, roadmap and followed it uh, to reopen their schools this past year. And I know you'll use those same uh, key strategies uh, that she's gonna share with you guys today as she transitions into another school year. So we're excited. So let me tell you a little bit about Castle. Um, it is the Academic for Social Emotional Learning. It's a trusted source. It's now not 25 years, but 26 years. We've been supporting educators and policy leaders. Uh, and so let me just give you a little personal story about Castle. When I worked in our school district, I was over, um, we called it then Safe Schools, Healthy Students, 
drug free schools. Uh, we had lots of names back in the day for that. But it was working with our most at promise students and students, all students. And when I found Castle and their five core competencies, which we're going to talk about, I would just, a light bulb went off. I went, yes, this is it. This is what we need to help students realize their unique potential and live up to it. So I was very excited to be a part now. I, I tell my colleagues that I've gone to the mothership uh, now that I'm working uh, for Castle and with Castle. So I'm very excited about our work. So to kind of set the tone for what we're going to be talking about today, we've got a short three minute video about what is SEL. School should be where everyone feels comfortable and everyone should know that everyone's unique and you don't have to be perfect. SEL is really about the holistic development of, of young people. Social emotional learning to me provides students with purpose. SEL was a great foundation and catalyst for me. It taught me to value education and value human connection. Social and emotional learning is the process by which children grow and develop their emotional lives and their relationships. Well, social and emotional learning gives the space where people can actually look at students as more than just numbers on a standardized test. We give people the space to explore who they are as people, to look at their identity, to, to recognize how important relationships are, and yes, what it means human. to be a successful human, not just a successful student. In my classroom, they are able to share the things that are personal to them. They're able to celebrate one another's differences. They're inclusive of each other, despite what race, socioeconomic, or gender they're from. SEL promotes um, academic achievement uh, in effective ways, raising test scores um, uh, 11 percentile points. It reduces uh, anxiety and distress as well. So it improves pro-social behavior and how kids get along and attend in the classroom. SEL is rocket fuel. It is the thing that can actually accelerate the advancement of our society. When I think about a healthy environment for my daughter, I'm looking at, are those teachers engaged? Are they showing her to uh, be an empathetic person? When teachers are engaged and they have that engagement with the students, the students are going to excel. The educators, the families, the community members, and the students agree that this is important. How do we make sure that kids don't just get a segment of their life where social and emotional learning is important, but they're getting that in all parts of their life. Right now we have an untapped pool of talent. And so the idea is to leverage SEL in order to help young people realize those talents and thereby help the broader society and in fact the world. We really can create schools that inspire, that help students find their sense of self, that help students find their sense of purpose, to learn how to relate to one another, and to better prepare kids for wherever they choose to go in life. Well, SEO taught you to step up when you need to, but also step back when you had to. So you were creating space for yourself, but also making space for others. Now we open a new chapter, and the new chapter is inviting educators, families, young people, scholars, policymakers, inviting the whole country into the dialogue about the kind of social and emotional development we want to promote for all of our children in the future. So, what is the SEL Castle framework? And I apologize, I understand that this script is very small, uh, but I, I believe uh, there is a link in your box that will take you, your chat box to take you directly to the framework, which was revised uh, in 2020 uh, to reflect some uh, other components, but to, ch to really basically chunk it down, SEL is the process. It's a process through which all young people, not some, but all people and adults acquire and apply their knowledge, 
the skills and the attitudes to develop healthy identities, manage your emotions, achieve personal and collective goals, feel and show empathy for others, establish and maintain supportive relationships and make responsible and caring decisions. It's a long definition. But what we know, especially as it relates to college and career, uh, employers are telling us across the nation, these are the skills that we want to see in our workforce. When kids come to, to the workforce and looking for jobs, these are the skills. In fact, um, a couple of weeks ago, I was in a webinar or presentation with a gentleman who said his son, who was an, had graduated from Harvard, was in an uh, interview and they did not ask him about his skills in this particular subject, he got his degree, but more about these core competencies, about getting along with others, making decisions, being aware, self-aware and socially aware. Uh, these were the skills because they were interested in hiring someone who got along well with others, who took direction, who was someone who was a teammate, a, a team person. So these skills are important. We know they're important and they're skills though that you don't learn by the age of, of 10 or 11, but they're skills that you acquire and develop throughout your life. So what are these skills? I'm just gonna briefly tell you what the five core competencies are. And especially now in this time with all the challenges uh, that we've recently faced and those challenges that we will face in the upcoming year, self-awareness is a key, being able to recognize how you're feeling and why, and to really set goals for yourself. Self-management, once you've recognized those feelings, how are you going to manage those feelings? And, and how are you going to go through those complex emotions that are set off sometimes, as we know, with kids with trauma by triggers? And what are those triggers? Social awareness, understanding the perspectives of others, having empathy, relationship skills. And guys, you know this, I know this, relationships are the foundation of social emotional learning, and they're the foundation of teaching. So connection, being able to connect with peers, with teachers, with families, with the community. It's all about relationships. And then responsible decision-making. We all need children and adults to be able to make those decisions that are in the best interest of others and themselves and to manage those priorities, especially about taking care of yourself and others. So those are the five core competencies. And so now we're going to, I'd like to take you into our um, roadmap. And there is a link in the chat box that I'd like for you to click on. And so you can follow along as we're talking about this, because I'm going to spend the first uh, two or three minutes talking to you about how to navigate this roadmap, because it is super easy. We made it for teachers for administrators with the goal in mind for it not to be overwhelming, to make it simple, easy to follow, and very actionable steps that you can take. Um, so if you'll click on that and follow along, I'll quickly tell you a little bit about what you'll see when you open that up. You will see that SEL is the critical practices are outlined in our roadmap. There are four crit critical practices that we have identified that are very important to examine and to look at as you're planning for next school year. The first one is to take time to cultivate and deepen those relationships. Again, that's number one to build partnerships and really plan for SEL. So as you're looking at this summer, uh, we do need to take time off for self-care, but we know we're planning to return to school. So how are you, how are your, uh, your schools, how are your teams within that school going to plan for SEL? And Kathleen's going to tell us a little bit more about that. The second critical practice, if I can get it to work, there we go, is to design opportunities where adults can connect and heal and build their capacity to support students. I know, uh, again, I'm preaching to the choir with this, but guys, it's not really about the students as much as it, it is about us as adults and how 
we connect and interact and support students. So it's very important for us to take this time as we plan for next school year to take the time to take care of ourselves in whatever form or fashion that may look like. And you've seen the old uh, cartoon where you have to put your oxygen mask on first in the plane before you can help a child. And that's true as we transition back to school. The third critical practice is to create safe, supportive, and equitable learning environments that promote all students' social and emotional development. We know a lot has been said in the past about school climate. Social and emotional learning is the foundation to a positive school climate where you can create those safe, nurturing, supportive environments that are not good just for a handful of students, but for every student in that classroom and in that school. And then finally, last, but certainly not least, is continuous improvement. We've got to look at the data as an opportunity to share power. You know, we as adults don't need to hold all that data. We need to realize that we need to share that not only with students, but we need to get it from students, but with families and with the community as well, and to share it within the staff of your school. So those are the four critical practices. And within of the, each of those critical practices, you will see, and I'll, we're gonna show some examples of this in just a moment, they're broken down into sub goals or subsets. For example, this one, 3.2, you're gonna weave in opportunities during the day. And then under each one of those, you have uh, essential questions. We're gonna, what you need to do to prepare, how you're gonna implement it, how are you gonna sustain it and tools. And that is my favorite part of this toolkit is the tools because as an educator, give me a good tool, give me a good strategy and I'll go to work. So these essential questions are really reflective questions for you to ask yourself as you're planning for SEL uh, during the school year. How are you, what actions are you going to take? What opportunities? How are you going to support teachers? So we ask you those essential questions, and then we give you suggestions on how to prepare. And everything you see in blue is hyperlinked. So you have examples and research that you can access there. And then on the implement side as well, it gives you some strategies to implement your plan along with uh, some additional resources. And then the tools. When you click on all of those tools, and every one of these tools uh, we vetted uh, last year, uh, Castle, uh, myself, and there were about four or five others that developed the toolkit, and we made sure we put in resources that we knew teachers and administrators could use and would use and would be easy to use. Um, because we know we don't have time, it's, uh, we've got a lot on our plates, so we wanna make this as simple as possible. And then how are you gonna sustain that? Let me just say this, over 37 years in education, what I do know for a certainty is if something doesn't work the first year, we just change it. We don't give it time to really percolate so we can see the results. It takes three to five years, research shows, for outcomes to be obvious and evident from practices that you implement or programs or initiatives. Please give this time because social emotional learning is not another add on to your already busy schedules. It's something as educators we do every day and social emotional learning are assets. You are looking for the strengths and playing to the strengths of students, not the deficits. When we say equitable learning environments, that's what we mean, where we play to the assets of students, not the negative, not, not the failings of that student. So this is an example, and we're gonna let Kathleen talk after this. This is critical practice number one, taking time to cultivate and deepen relationships. And the four subsets under critical practice one, foster new relationships, use two-way communication strategies, examine impact of SEL efforts, 
and build a broad coalition and integrate SEL into your plans. And let me just say a word about this. We in education cannot do this work alone. We need to rely on families, community partners, mental health agencies in particular, uh, as we transition back. There are sometimes too many people, we have to vet everyone that wants to come into our school setting, but we need those folks to help us and support us in education. So Kathleen, I'm gonna turn it over to you under critical practice one, you're gonna to talk to us about how Davis School District addressed that. Thanks, and Pat is going to run my slides for me. So just as a quick way of introduction, just so you all know, um, this roadmap came out a year ago in June, and um, as we all went into quarantine a year ago March, um, our district came out of quarantine and said, well, we're starting school in the fall, we're going to start in person, we're going to do some hybrid, we're going to do some online, but we're going to go as much in person as we can, and, and we did that, so we had to really gear up very quickly uh, and, and get everybody ready to go in person. And as you all understand, we've had a, a you know, this, this common trauma, we've all shared that. Um, there was a lot of trepidation in how do I start school? Uh, I've got teachers that are upset or concerned. I've got parents, I've got families, I've got administrators. So how do we do this? So we put together um, what we thought would be a, a fairly simplistic way for people to implement SEL and think about that in their opening of school plans. Next slide. So this might be a little redundant, but we really wanted everybody to understand why are we focusing on SEL? And we made it very clear that SEL can help educators, students, and families adapt to new environments. We had lots of new environments last fall and we will continue to have those new environments. Um, and so adapting to new environments, being able to manage new expectations, and then foster that uh, sense of belonging that we all feel is very important as we um, get back into school. Next slide. Thank you. So what we wanted to do was we started out with building capacity with our leadership. We really worked with our departments, with our um, directors, school directors, and with all of our school administrators and th their entire teams. We, want, we wanted them to understand what skills that they might need personally and then be able to provide models and opportunities for the faculty and staff and then in turn also for families and students. Because we know that when we are doing the kinds of things that uh, we know we need to do to take care of ourselves or to take care of our faculty and staff, that those, those models are being watched by our families and by our students. And that creates that safe space for everyone to feel supported, empowered, and uh, learn and process from these experiences that, we, that we've all had and continue to have. Next slide. All right, so here's what we did. We took some of the really good tools from CASEL um, and we told our leadership, here are a couple of things we want you to do. Just think about these two things to begin the school year. We want you to use and become very familiar with the three signature practices. And the three signature practices can be done in all adult learning settings, faculty meetings, PLCs, uh, grade level meetings, um, any sort of department meetings. but but know what these three signature practices are and model those. And if you're not familiar with those three signature practices, they include welcoming and inclusion activities where you would greet everyone. If I were in a leadership setting, I would greet everyone in the, in the meeting in some form. If it's a small setting, you can have them introduce themselves like we did today in the chat. If it's a larger setting, you can do a welcoming and inclusion activity where they turn and talk to their neighbor. Um, lots of different things and there's great ideas in the uh, signature practices playbook. And then throughout the meeting time, you also wanna do some engaging strategies. Those engaging strategies might be a mindful moment or a reflection or a turn and talk to your elbow partner, or it might be a movement piece. But again, those, those um, engaging strategies where you have a chance to um, reflect and then refocus and, and move forward with your training or your meeting. And then finally, an optimistic closure. And now optimistic closure does not mean that we just all leave on a high note. But it, what it does mean is that we reflect on what is our next step? With this information, what am I going to do next? 
So it's kind of a commit to move forward. Um, and that's really important, especially as people were feeling very stuck, especially in, in um, quarantine. What is their next step to move forward? What is it they need to do next with the information you provided? So we asked all of our leaders in all leadership trainings and settings to start using these three signature practices throughout, the, throughout all last year. And uh, we modeled it, first of all, at our district level and our superintendent modeled it every Zoom call. We did it a welcoming inclusion. We did some sort of an engaging strategy and we did an optimistic closure. So you can do it virtually or you can do it in person or through hybrid. The other piece that we thought was quite uh, meaningful, um, we asked our leaders to spend uh, just a few minutes with each of their faculty members, especially those that they really had some concerns with coming back into uh, an in-person setting. And um, Council provides a really great um, model of how to do a five minute chat with the principal. And it just um, furthers that relationship building with your faculty and staff. I had several principals who said, you know, this really helped me because it was the kind of tool I could use. Let me give you a couple examples of the questions. Let me just pull up one here. Um, so it has you, the, the five minute chat with the principal is really nice because it, it makes you feel comfortable that you can do this five minute chat, even if it's a setting or a, a circumstance that maybe you and that individual, you don't know each other that well, or you might feel a little uncomfortable because of some things that maybe they've talked to you about, whatever it might be. But it just kind of takes that and makes it a very meaningful chat. But you initiate a conversation, just something as simple as, do you have five minutes to chat with me? I'd like to know what everyone on the staff is thinking about, they'd like to accomplish this year and how I can be supportive of that. So as a leader, you can, you can then have these engaging conversations and it doesn't take a long time. Um, and I really liked some of the things at the end because they did the optimistic closure and the optimistic closure in a five minute chat can be, um, what's keeping you going or what's giving you energy or what's putting that smile on your face. So it becomes more of that relationship building with your faculty and staff. So yeah. next slide. And I, I think this is me, yeah. Okay. And so let me kind of piggyback and echo a couple of things you said, Kathleen, that really resonated with me and a point that I wanna make. These signature practices um, and, and what you talked about, how much did that cost uh, your district to do, Kathleen? Absolutely nothing. That's right. <laughs> and, and, and this is what I love. These strategies are simply the way you do business at school. It's, it's how you operate at school, using these strategies to help change the culture in your school. And to, to really, for administrators, um, I'm a big shared leadership person and wanting to hear the voices uh, of staff. So this is a great opportunity to do that. And you do this in your classroom. Um, many of you might use these three signature practices on how you operate within the classroom each day as well. So great job, Kathleen, lots of good stuff. So our SEL critical practice number two is about you, the adult, uh, where you can come and connect and heal and heal and build your capacity because you you said a key word too there Kathleen model we are the models for social emotional learning in the classroom so we need to work on our social emotional learning skills just in concert with our students uh, and it is a work in progress nobody is perfect and including me I, I have uh I fall off the wagon, as I said many times with that. But you, for administrators and for school staff, it's very important that you have a place to go where you can, uh, if you need five minutes away, 10 minutes away, could be a small group setting where you have the opportunity to, in a safe space to connect and to heal. To have that access to mental health, not just for the students, but for you as adults. Uh, identify opportunities for innovation and anti-racist practices. So what we want to do is look at uh, maybe cultural responsive teaching uh, and because cultural responsive teaching are those practices that really foster that safe nurturing atmosphere and climate in your school. And the other is professional learning. We need professional learning and we are constantly bombarded by professional learning, but there are a, a ton of places uh, and organizations that I could point you to that have one hour modules 
that you can use. One is with the American Institute of Research as an SEL 101. If you want to introduce social emotional learning to folks at your school, that's a perfect way to do that with that, that module. So Kathleen, what do you guys, uh, what did you do last year? Well, really we reached out to educators and we wanted them to kind of take some ownership about how their needs could best be met um, and really focus on themselves. We tried to remind educators that uh, the feelings they were having were shared by families and parents, so don't, or families and students, so don't forget that because it's very real and we wanted to um, recognize and value that those feelings need to be um, something that we feel comfortable in sharing and be able to move forward. Next slide. So here's the great question for all of you. Um, Whatever setting you're in, how can your school put staff well-being at the center of school culture? As you look to open in the fall, whatever the situation is that you're in, how do you look at putting staff well-being at the center of your school culture? You know, it's kind of the old happy, you know, happy mom, happy kids, that same kind of an idea when, when the, the faculty and staff feel valued and empowered and feel like um, their needs are being met then that permeates the culture of the school. So what we wanted to do is have our educators really look at how they could implement faculty uh, activities and strategies around SEL and then encourage and support each other in their own personal care. So we really broke educator strategies into, into two groups. And the first one is around taking care of ourselves as, as adults and as educators. Next slide. So here's a couple of things we provided. We provided these to our to our leaders, but we also sent them out to all of our um, educators. It's also available on our, our, we have a reopening school toolkit as well that we modeled after Castle. So we want to just say intentionally look at tools that might work for you. And we mentioned this to a number of our principals that at one of their faculty opening meetings, they might sit down and have um, their faculty participate in this self-care self-assessment and the, it, this hyperlinked in the slides. This is a really uh, nice way to have everyone take a little bit of a breath and really think through what it is that they're dealing with and then put together their own personal plan. Of course, that's something that's very personal. We didn't ask our leaders to, you know, don't turn it in, but, but you could ask for then volunteers around what can we do to support your personal plan. We can't take away all of these burdens you have. We can't take away the things that we have to do around our work, but what can we do to be supportive, not only of you, but of each other as we move forward together? Because that's the whole idea is being able to move forward. And then we asked them to practice these um, SEL skills, especially the, the pieces around the the uh, three signature practices, but practice those skills in faculty meeting, teach some things that, that are, uh, you want them to then maybe take back to their classroom, but they could use them personally and find what they really like that works for them. Um, we're all aware that you can download Calm and Headspace that's free to educators. Um, another uh, curriculum with videos for mindful movement, breathing and rest is from Pure Edge. If you're not familiar with them, that's a free resource. Um, they provide brain breaks, uh, they have a PE curriculum, they have a um, neuroscience curriculum, but they really have just these really short vignettes showing you how to do some of the breathing movement exercises. So it's very simple to integrate that into your faculty or staff training. Um, you also might want to find, and I think Pat mentioned this, a mindful space in your building, a place where teachers can go and just have five minutes. And uh, a lot of our schools put this into place where they just turned a closet into, uh, you know, they had a closet, they cleaned it out, they painted it light blue, put some clouds on the sky, put in a comfortable chair or two, a little refrigerator, and just told teachers, when you need a little break, this is where you can come. And no questions asked. And that's been very helpful in a number of our schools. And then I think the last thing as a faculty and staff, you need to advocate and the leaders need to support that you have some time for planning and collaboration around SEL so that you can not only design lessons for students, but you can really have that time to work together and uh, be able to think about the kinds of things and process those things that, that not only you are experiencing, but that your families and students have experienced. So here's some things we said, we want this just for educators. Here are th some things you can do. A couple of these things I've mentioned, but this is a pretty simple list. And again, this is a no cost list. 
first talk it out, process your feelings with a colleague, find a wellness buddy, um, take time during the school day to reflect on how you're feeling, use some of those apps, you can download them and you can do a, a, a you know, a 30 second mindful break or you can do a guided practice. I have a principal that at the end of the school day, um, he, before he goes to afternoon or evening activities, he turns his lights off in his, in his office. His secretary knows exactly what's going on and he does a body scan. It takes him about 10 minutes. So he turns the lights off, he lays down on his, on his floor and he does the body scan. So then he can be refocused and ready to go um, to the next level of extracurricular activities, which a lot of our secondary schools do, of course. Um, some people like to write, so just write it out. I love this idea. You set a timer for eight minutes and write it all out on paper. And for some, this really offloads any worry that they might have. And here's a real big one, avoid the toxic colleague. Uh, and the next one goes with it, avoid social media. You know, take a break from social media if it's negative. I think there's a lot of good positive in social media, but you've got to find the positive and just, you know, take a break from all that negative because that can really bring you down. Next yeah, slide. And, uh, so Kathleen, I'm going to skip ahead for time's okay. sake to critical practice three, but I want to take this time to invite you in the chat box. If you have a self-care strategy that you practice, that you find extremely effective, and you may have done this at your school, put that in the chat box. So we'll have an opportunity to share what it is you guys are doing for teacher self-care. And let's move to critical practice three. And I know this is the one that we are most anxious about it, and that's working with kids. So how do we go and create those safe, supportive, and equitable learning environments for our students? We have to build those relationships. We have to weave in opportunities for practice and reflection. We have to have that MTSS, that multi-tiered system of supports that addresses the whole child. We have to be able to talk about the impact the pandemic has had on our um, communities and the recent events in the, in, the, in the media as well, because kids watch TV, we know that, and we hear these conversations um, within the community. And again, we've got to collaborate with families and partners because we as educators cannot do, do this solely by ourselves. So Kathleen, tell us about what you guys do for students. Thank you. Um, so really, as you're looking how to model these things for yourself as an educator, a lot of these things then can be done for students. So go ahead to the next slide. Embedding the SEL practices is probably the most valuable thing you can do. We tried to just structure five things we felt teachers could take on last year when we reopened buildings. We said, just do these five things. Next slide. First, first one we want to do is create that structure because we know structure uh, is when you create structure and you have a visual structure for kids, it's very helpful for them. They feel much more settled and less chaos happening in their life. This is another place you might want to do the five minute chat with the student, which is very similar to five minute chat with the principal. Next slide. Um, build community. It's really important that you build community. There's a number of ways you can do that. We've suggested that our elementary schools, they host a morning meeting um, to build that classroom community. You can use another free curriculum from Harmony. They've got quick connection cards that are all actually really good for even adult settings where you make these connections very quickly in the morning in a morning meeting. We know that our secondary students also need that daily check-in. If you have access to Nearpod, Nearpod has some great little check-ins for um, K through 12 that you can use either, either uh, in a you know advisory setting or maybe it's everyday first period, whatever it is at a secondary setting. Uh, might be a little bit different than what we do in elementary. Also, you can use the emotion faces to check in throughout the day. Those are, those are free. You can do that anytime. And then we really want to focus. And I'm just going to say you can go back to use some of those strategies that Pure Edge offers for free. Next slide. Uh, well, before we go to the next one, let me let me make two comments on, on this. Uh, number one, um, the research has shown the two most effective practices that promote social emotional learning in the classroom are class meetings. And the other is cooperative learning groups within with regard to instructional practices. And all you have to do is Google this. There are 10 instructional uh, teaching practices, uh, instructional practices that 
focus on the development or enhance the development of social emotional learning in the classroom. Uh, if you wanted just to put 10 instructional practices uh, that promote social emotional learning, it will pop up. It's from great teachers and leaders. Uh, and also when I was with the Department of Education in Tennessee, we also did that, uh, those instructional practices and made see it in action videos. So um, I can hopefully put that in the chat for you as well. Thanks, Pat. The next piece we did was we wanted those three, those three signature practices also in the classroom because they work in the classroom every bit as, as well as they do in an adult learning setting. Um, and the next really is providing that voice and choice for students, asking them what they want to learn, incorporating their, their curiosity and their request into the classroom teaching, and then identify opportunities for students who are struggling um, to build a sense of academic competence, especially coming back. We've all heard the, you know, there's going to be some loss of academics, but quite honestly, what have they lost? I don't know, compared to what? So just take kids where they are, move them as far as you can, and I love this idea that you might just send a little note at the end of the day, uh, telling a period or the end of the period, telling a student something that they did well to help build their academic confidence. And I also want to put in um, a plug uh, when you're looking at uh, selecting uh, a program for social emotional learning. Castle just recently uh, revealed and, and put on their website the Castle Program Guide that uh, will help in that selection. It's a rigorous evaluation process that programs go through uh, that really uh, speaks to the quality and content of SEL within those programs backed by research. Uh, so that is available on our website, newly released uh, within the past four to six weeks. So that's a, a great way when you're looking at selecting an SEL program. And then our fourth, but definitely, again, the most important, because we're all data driven, is to really look at the data you collect and to reflect upon that uh, to advance your work in your school community. And again, an, oper uh, an opportunity to really share power, especially with students. Uh, one of the many programs that I had at the state and at the district were all positive youth development programs where we empower students to have a voice and a choice. And when we can elevate that student voice uh, we are helping them to develop the agency that they need to be successful and to move forward in life. So we can involve students in sharing that data. And I know many of you probably uh, have uh, student-led uh, parent-teacher conferences uh, that you can share and reflect about that. Uh, but they're powerful if you've ever seen one in, in action. And we need to support educators in reflecting on our instruction and environment. And Kathleen, you talked about uh, the signature practices and then we talked about class meetings. One of the practices I really encourage principals to embrace are staff meetings in a circle. Typically when I was in a district, we all sat in rows with our backs to each other and never made eye contact. Eye contact. What we want to do is reverse that. We're all in this together, literally. And when we're in a circle, we feel as though it's shared leadership, that what we say matters. Uh, so I invite administrators, um, any adult meetings, school boards, uh, to really follow the three signature practices. And, and when possible, and where possible, is to meet in that circle. And again, to partner with families and those community members to improve. So I want to um, give you another um, piece that I think is important when we're talking about data is, uh, how, do we want to assess social emotional learning? Typically what I see in most states is they administer what is known as a school climate survey. And that school climate survey 
uh, does assess components of social emotional learning, but CASEL also has an SEL assessment guide to help you in um, thinking about assessment, if that's something that you're interested in, uh, and to use that criteria when you select uh, your assessment piece. So if there's a lot of pros and cons, it's, it's just a wonderful guide for you to use as well. And then the other thing, and I want Kathleen to talk about this, um, is our school-wide SEL walkthrough protocol. And I can speak because I'm located at, in Nashville, uh, outside of Nashville. And when I was with the State Department, uh, I went to observe Metro Nashville Public Schools and they were doing a school-wide SEL walkthrough protocol at the end of the year. And when I went into the building to do that observation, I thought, oh my gosh, this is a great building because you can tell what the climate of a school is by walking through the front door. So we did the walkthrough. And when we came to talk to the principal at the end, she was nervous. And, the, and I said, oh, your building is awesome. Your kids were all on task. It felt warm and adults, it was respectful, blah, blah, blah. And uh, the principal looked at me and she said, well, in the fall, kids were climbing out windows. Teachers were going crazy. The kids were running wild and on and on and on. Through SEL implementation, they had gone from that in the fall to what I saw in the spring. So Kathleen, do you guys use something similar? We do. Um, we designed, we use this as a model, but we designed our own walkthrough tool and we aligned that with the castle competencies and also with our um, school climate survey. So the walkthrough tool we've asked schools to do in the fall and then the climate survey um, we that's administered in the spring. So we kind of have the, the pre and then the post and then our schools all requ are required to do an SEL goal as part of the school improvement planning process. And so based on that goal, then we're able from our department to support them in the kinds of things they, they'd like to implement. And I just wanna piggyback off of something Pat said. We had one of our model schools, um, even though they got interrupted with COVID, um, they were doing the pre and post and they were measuring using also office referrals. And they found, this was an elementary school and they found their office referrals went from way too many to hardly any. And they couldn't really believe it, but it really happened. And um, so the implementation, being able to then use an assessment tool where you can measure and see if the things that you're doing um, are working and that you're meeting the goals that you've set for your school improvement planning process um, are, are very important and they're, they're vital to make sure that you have sus um, sustainability. Great. And I know we have running out of time and we do wanna have a few minutes for questions, but at this time, uh, if you have a favorite SEL strategy that you use in your classroom or that you have seen used in a classroom or in a school or a favorite SEL program, I invite you to put that in the chat box at this time because we educators learn best from one another and we're all about sharing ideas that we can borrow and take back to our schools uh, in the fall. So I invite you to put some of those strategies that you utilize into the chat box as we move to our questions. We wanted to take this time to answer any questions that you might have uh, about social emotional learning uh, about implementation of social emotional learning, about reopening schools. So, uh, oh, I love someone put restorative circles in every classroom. Wonderful. Restorative learning and restorative practices are, are SEL focused practices and PBIS is as well. And both groups have done a crosswalk with CASEL's five core competencies to show uh, where those competencies lie within their programs. Uh, optimistic closure. So what moves you to think? What moves your heart? What moves you to action? Love that. Well, I don't think we have any questions unless, Jason, you have... Um, 
seen any? No, I think we've, uh, I think we've, we've covered them really effectively. Um, this has been really impressive. So I want to address just a couple things. There's been a, a ton of information presented here and Pat's been generous enough to um, authorize that we can share this PowerPoint. Um, so we've recorded this. It will be up on our website within the, the next couple of days, uh, either by tomorrow or Monday. And then uh, you'll be able to review the video. But if you want the PowerPoint, you'll receive a follow-up email from YTRI. Just respond to that, that you have interest in the PowerPoint, and we'll be able to get it to you. Um, Pat, you may have shared it with Bruce, but if you don't mind, share the share that. E you can email me after, but just email me the, the slides over after, and I'll make sure that we have them linked so that we can get them out to anybody that requests it. Um, one thing I do like to conclude with, and it kind of goes along with um, one of the practices that um, Kathleen referenced, um, I'm going to put you, I'm going to turn the tables back on you. This is kind of like the question of uh, what's putting the smile on your face right now. I'm going to modify it just a little bit. The, the one I like to ask is, what is giving you hope right now? I'm going to, I'm going to go to, uh, I'm going to put you both on the spot. Let's go first to Pat and then to Kathleen. What is giving you hope right now after a, a challenging 2020 and 2021? Go ahead, Pat. Uh, well, and that's a great question. There are many things that are giving me hope, but what really gives me hope are our young people. And um, the young people that I am closely associated with which I, sometimes you wonder if they like school or not. So, oh, we can't wait to go back to school. We want to be there. We, you know, kids need school. And we have some awesome young people uh, that need to be in school so that we as adults can role model these skills uh, for them and help them to develop those skills within themselves. So our young people give me hope every day. Awesome. Thank you. And I'm going to borrow the share and I'm going to put up a couple extra links on some slides, if that's all right, Pat. Absolutely. Um, Kathleen, what's uh, what's giving you hope right now? Well, I think the thing right now is seeing everybody smile. You know, um, it's just nice to have people in the building and collaborating again. Uh, Zoom is great and it's great to reach out to, you know, being able to, to meet everybody. But there's nothing like that in person where you get to actually see people smile and, and appreciate um, being back together again. Thank you so much. And I'm going to add, I'll answer the, uh, the question myself as well. I, and I've answered this several times and it's, you know, it's always something different. But, but right now, um, I think it's a combination of the both. Um, I'll, I'll get a little bit personal. My, uh, my two oldest kids play basketball on the high school basketball team and they're playing in a, in a tournament this week and um, seeing them back out and, and participating in a, in a school based activity um, and interacting has, has given me a ton of hope. I'm really excited for them uh, coming into next year. My oldest son is going to be a, a senior and uh, his younger brother is going to be a sophomore and um Seeing, I guess, in, in combination with what you said, Pat, seeing young kids, young kids are remarkably resilient. They teach me as much as I have ever taught them. And I'm so thrilled to see how they've responded to this. And I, I'm so excited for, um, you know, for us as educators to be able to, to go out and hopefully put these, these practices into place uh, going into to next year. Um, any any parting thoughts? Anything that uh, that came to mind that you didn't get to share that you wanted to mention before we conclude, uh, Pat and Kathleen? Uh, I just go ahead, Kathleen. I was just gonna say I just appreciate everyone on the webinar because I know you got other places to be. Yeah. But it, just, it just feels so good to have uh, the collegiality again. Uh, not that we haven't had it, but it's just it's nice to move forward with it. So thank you for participating. And uh, th I echo what Kathleen said, and I, I, there are a lot of comments in the chat about the links to what we've uh, presented today. So if we could make sure those links are captured, maybe they are in the recording, um, but if we could send the links as well, that'd be awesome. 
Yeah, yeah, we've we've got both of those. So if you'll give me those slides, uh, look for that follow up email from Ytry. We'll be happy to share those slides and the links. Um, this is so fun. I just we just got a shout out from my friend, our our, our friend Denise down in uh down in Conroe. So good to see you. Uh, love it when we have friends come back. And this has been this has been as we've had like. I guarantee you got more resources per minute in this in this <laughs> webinar than you've gotten in a long time. So there's a lot in there. Please, please, please respond back to the email or reach out to us first, and we'll be happy to get these. Give us about a day to two, a day or two to get things loaded up in a in a format that we can share with you. And uh, please share this. I know it's summer, but share this with your faculty, with your staff. There's so much good information, and we owe it to each other, and we owe it to these kiddos to start off on a on a strong foot next year and uh, and really come out of the gate strong. So. Thank you so much to our panelists. Huge round, virtual round of applause for our panelists. And then in conclusion, um, huge virtual round of applause for yourselves. I echo Kathleen's uh, statements. The, the fact that you showed up here in the summer to be part of this um, speaks volumes because uh, it, it really is. I've said it before, the greatest humans in the world get into, into this world to try to help educate and support kids through whatever capacity, whatever role we have. And uh, thank you so much. Appreciate you all. Love thank you. you. Take um, care. I'm going to play us out with some music now again, because that's, uh, that's kind of what I do. It's like my favorite thing to do. And uh, <laughs> Pat and Kathleen, you're welcome to stay on and peruse the chat as long as you would like. And if you need to take off, I know Kathleen, you needed to get to another event right away. We really appreciate your time on this, um, but uh, feel free to stay on otherwise, as long as you'd like. And let's get a, we need a good song. Oh, we're gonna go Stevie Wonder, Higher Ground. How can you not, how can you not? <laughs>